I am Vinny Tolerich. Folks, your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed, just like the man on the other mic today. He's been on the show uh, several times over the years. Uh, we, I think the first time he came on was in the first 50 shows. We've now done well over 2,300 shows, and this guy was brave enough when we were nobodies. Well, we're still kind of nobodies, but... He came on early on and uh, came on a lot and then got into trouble by doing absolutely nothing. Oh, that's right. He he became, uh, he was lawless, man. And uh, then we couldn't get him on for a couple of years because he was fighting legal battles. But now he's back with us again, probably for the fifth, sixth or seventh time. I have no idea how many times he's been on, but folks, go back and listen to those old episodes. They're absolute gold. I'm talking about none other than uh, Professor uh, Timothy Noakes. How are you doing, Tim? Vinny, very well. Thanks for reminding me about those good old days. Well, actually, <laughs> they better days today. So we've come but, through it and uh, loved it, loved every moment of it. There are better days. And for anyone who's not in the know, and I like, you know, I recover, you know, I do things over and over sometimes because we get new audience all the time. You know, we see the, the tens of thousands of people who come on that probably have never heard of Dr. Tim Noakes and which is a shame because you've probably done more studies in this area than I would say anyone in the world, including Verta Health and all of these people who are coming up now. You've been studying um, as an as a medical doctor and as a professor, si sports science ever since I was in college back in the 80s. I mean, you, you were a big deal to us back then. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I, you know, I was very fortunate because I finished my medical training 1977, 1975, sorry. And that was really the start of sports science. The modern sports science begins in the 1970s. If we go back to the 1968 Olympics, the American team was sent with a doctor who was phoned up the night before and asked, would he please go with the American team to the Olympics? So, I mean, it was completely amateur. And everything changed in about 1967 because, sorry, 1976, because the East Germans came and they were being successful. And everyone realized that if North Americans wanted to be successful and the Scandinavians and the British, they'd have to study sports science. So all of a sudden, sports science took off. So I was fortunate to be there right at the beginning. And the beauty of sports science is it's a complete science. You have to look at all the human body to work out how this body works and how to help it optimize its performance it's not a it's not a focal thing look you're looking at some small area you need to look at the whole animal and i think that's uh, that i was very fortunate to to be at the start when you could know everything about a field that of course has changed but i grew with uh, my career grew with the discipline as it progressed yeah, you know, I remember um, when when the Eastern Bloc company, countries were all, you know, all of a sudden they were open. Like we never knew why they were winning and all of this kind of, well, one of the things we learned is, you know, performance enhancing drugs were, were pretty rampant. And, um, you know, when their volleyball, their female volleyball team would show up, they sounded like men when they spoke, you know, and as, as one coach put it, we didn't come to sing, we came to play volleyball. Um, I think it was a famous <laughs> quote. But we didn't just learn about steroids from those people and performance enhancing drugs. I remember back in 81, when I was getting my exercise physiology degree, all of a sudden, or was it 83 or 84? It was the first time I heard the word plyometrics. And what plyometrics, you know, now you see people in gyms jumping on things, jumping off of things. They think plyometrics started last week, but we learned about this from the Eastern, from, from the Russians, from the Croats, from, from some of those countries. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, you know, they pushed the boundaries of sports science and you're quite correct that they they did use a lot of drugs and that was completely unethical and terrible. However, they did, they did try to look at everything and to maximize performance and, and they pushed the science forward. And so, yes, it was interesting. I'm uh, interesting that the East Germans, I've just come across some, the story of lactic acid and how they studied that. And they were way in advance of, of everyone. They were really pushed the boat out. But unfortunately, they, they damaged many, many young men and young women with the high doses of steroids. So in the end, it was 
Porsche, we moved over, we got over it and have moved on. Well, you know, hopefully, because as I've always said, the athletes are always one step ahead of science, which has always been an odd thing, you know, in this country and every, you know, you know people who want to be highly competitive, we see these athletes coming along and you go, okay, he's, he or she has to be doing something, right? This is not normal. And, um, and then we find out, okay, now we have some way to test this, that, and the other thing. We always figure it out, you know, one day too late. You know, it, it, isn't it strange? How is it that the athletes can always be one step ahead? You know, we think of, of Dr. Ferrari over in Italy who yeah. did this right. within, uh, you know, WADA was chasing this guy for, what, 20 years before they were able to tag him with anything, correct? Yeah, you know, I, I wrote an editorial for the New England Journal of Medicine in 2004, in which I said, was it possible to win the Tour de France without doping? And I said, no. And that was, of course, that was at the height of Lance Armstrong. So, I, and then I, there's a famous book written by an Australian who, I think it was leading up to the 2000 Olympics, which were going to be held in Sydney. And he was a javelin thrower or a discus thrower, I quite recall. And in training, he threw a world record. And he, he said, I haven't even started peaking for the Olympic Games. So he realized that the doping was going to make him do performances that were totally unacceptable. And he said, that's it. I give up. I quit now. And so that that threw a light on other countries, not just uh, the East Germans had, they were doing it. And he said, I couldn't live with my family knowing that I had won a gold medal at the Olympics because of the doping. But when I drew attention to that book, people said, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. I mean, that was even in those days that we used that term. Yeah. Well, look, I, I remember, you know, let's go back to, you know, the aforementioned Lance Armstrong. You know, people would ask me, you know, because I was a cyclist and yeah. I I knew, uh, you know, a bit about this, this subject because it's all I've ever studied. And they would say, do you think he's using drugs? And I would say, absolutely. And they would say, well, how can you say that? And it's like, well, there's a couple of ways you can say that. Um, number one, he was a really good cyclist before he had his cancer, but he wasn't, you know, a GC contender. He wasn't a grand tour winner. He was more of a really good domestique. Yeah. He wasn't particularly good at, at sprinting. You know, he wasn't particularly good at climbing. And then he goes off and has cancer and he comes back and he's superhuman. And if that doesn't convince you, everyone that he beat in those years, you know, Jan Ulrich, and you, I, I could go down the, the laundry list of incredible athletes. These people were always better athletes than him, and they were caught doing drugs along the way. So he was beating other guys that were superior to him athletically and also on drugs. Exactly. So people go, well, are you sure? It's like, yeah, it just doesn't work that way. Your Your, your physiology you are who you are and that's it. You can't yeah. just go right past that without having something do it for you. What, what say you, Doc? No, I agree. Um, you know, I lived the, the, I followed the, the, the people who followed as cycling and exactly as you said, they said the performances, and I think was it, was it the, I forget which Tour de France it was, but in the prologue, he did a performance which was beyond belief. And then they, they said, no, there's something going on here. And yeah. there was the Irish journalist who asked him and was the first to sort of blow the whistle. But he got demonized for raising those questions. And stayed demonized for a long time, correct? Yeah. And I remember Le Monde saying that, Greg Le Monde saying that he remembered one Tour de France. He won the year before. And then the next year, he couldn't keep up with the peloton. So th this was the best cyclist in the world. And the next year, he couldn't keep up with the peloton. And that's when EPO was introduced for the first time. So he knew something had changed in, in the one year that everything had changed. So it was very clear that doping was was had been reintroduced with new drugs. And EPO is one of the most effective doping agents that there is. Yeah, it, uh, folks, or anyone who's not in the know, uh, epigen or EPO um, is a drug that raises artificially raises your red blood cells, uh, and red blood cells carries oxygen. And that you know, all of a sudden, you know, the the one weakest link. You can have muscles as strong as you want, but if you can't get the oxygen to those muscles, then you can't get them to perform, especially aerobically, 
which is something we're going to get into with uh, Dr. Milks a little later today, because I mean, we're going to talk about low carb and, and getting that oxygen, getting that pedal to the metal, if you will. Um, we've covered this before, Dr. Noakes, but I want to cover it again. Um, when you wrote, and it's hard to, it almost sounds like I'm making this up. But when you wrote a best-selling book about running, which <laughs> I don't know if anyone else in history has ever done, it, it, it sounds like I'm making that part up. But you, you wrote um, Law of Running uh, way back when. It, it, it became a Bible for guys like me because we didn't just look at running. We said, like, okay, we can move this to you know, rowing. We can use it with cycling. We could just use this information across the board. I, I think that book is in its fourth or fifth you know, yeah, yeah. I'm glad to say yes. This is the fourth edition. So, for those who don't aren't aware of it, yeah. And I'm currently rewriting it because there's a lot of wrong in the book, <laughs> as we'll discuss. And, and that's and, what I love about you. You always change. You don't just stick to your guns to try to make something fit a narrative that you had years ago. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, you have to move with the evidence and. And I'm sure we're going to get to it, but there's so much wrong in that I've had to, certainly the chapter on metabolism is completely rewritten. I had to, fortunately, so what happened in my career was I, the last edition was written 20 years ago. And then I got into the space where I was being charged with promoting the wrong diet and so on. So I had to save my name there. And that took 10 years. And that, that produced this book, Real Food on Trial. <laughs> which is the story of <laughs> how the diet dictators tried to destroy a top scientist. So this was my trial, which went over four years. And now, fortunately, I got rid of that. But then I actually learned something about nutrition. I thought I knew something about nutrition, but turns out I didn't. I had to go and be charged with all sorts of bad things and to defend myself. So now I've got the beauty that I actually understand nutrition much better so now i can rewrite the the chapters in this book on nutrition and particularly on what you should be eating if you want to maximize your health and your longevity before i didn't understand what you should eat to promote health because i was eating this high carbohydrate diet and i developed type 2 diabetes so clearly it wasn't right if and i remember I right you, you were in your late 20s you weren't even 30 yet but you know I, I have a bit of a photographic i'm gonna go with 28 years old you, you 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 were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes you were a runner um and you know at some point you i can't remember when it was but you it was less than 20 years ago maybe 10 years ago where you just oh, took yeah. your book and and publicly ripped the whole nutrition <laughs> section out you know on on camera and that's right and then the world decided to hate the most beloved sports scientist doctor. Can you explain a bit of that? So you're quite right. The, the When I was 28, we were doing studies on low-carbohydrate diets. Can you believe it? I mean, this was in 1978. Crazy. And uh, just by chance, I helped my colleague who was doing, he wanted to study post-exercise ketosis. And literally no one understood what causes post-exercise ketosis. It was an unknown. And so I was one of the subjects. We used to run for two hours on the treadmill and not eat carbs. And, and it turned out that when I ate carbs, we had a high carb diet, then we had low carbs, and then we had a rest day. But on the high carb diet, I, my insulin, fasting insulin was six times normal, six times normal. So I was profoundly insulin resistant, despite the fact that I was running 130, 140 kilometers a week. I was incredibly lean. My body mass index was 21. And despite that, I was profoundly insulin resistant. So that's the genetic component. Then I started eating this high carb diet and promoting it. And then by eventually, by the age of 60, that was in 2010, I eventually realized that I had type 2 diabetes, reversed it with this diet. And it was literally by chance that, that I picked up a book written by the great Volek Finney and Volek Finney and Westman. Yeah. And that changed my life. And then I read that book and I said, oh my gosh, I've been wrong. And I said, I'm going to try this low carb diet. And within a day, I felt better because obviously I was diabetic. And then as soon as I cut the carbs, I started to feel better. So so that was the story. And then I, my running improved dramatically and my health improved. And I should be dead, you see. I should now be dead because my dad 
type 2 diabetes treated conventionally was dead within 10 years of the diagnosis. So wow. I'm way past 10 years and I'm doing okay. I haven't got any symptoms, cross fingers, touch wood. And uh, so I'm not suggesting I'm never going to die of diabetes or its complications, but at the moment I'm, I'm doing reasonably well. Yeah, I would stay away from buses. You have a greater chance of being hit by a bus than you, you do from, you know, if you're eating this way from uh, diabetes. So you you make this discovery. Um, Westman, folks, if you want to go back and listen, Westman's been on the show as many times as Dr. Noakes. Um, as a matter of fact, Dr. Westman was in uh, both of my first two movies, Fatter Documentary and Fatter Documentary 2. And um, whenever I, I, I have any questions, he's one of those guys that's on my short list to call because he wrote, he, he rewrote what Atkins wrote. Um, Westman yeah. was doing this stuff along with Finney and Volick for, for a decade before guys like me got on the in internet and started saying, Hey, you know, do this. And right before the show started, uh, Dr. Noakes asked me, he goes, what is NSNG? And I said, you know, no sugars, no grains. Because when I wrote fitness confidential, I was loath to put the word, ketogenic in a book. I, if you look at that book, read that book cover to cover, you will not see the word ketogenic. I'll, I'll allude to low carb. I just say no sugars, no grains, you'll be fine. I was scared to write those words mm -hmm. because they were still bad. You know, people would bastardize it and go, well, my doctor says ketoacidosis will kill you and, and right. ketogenic diets will lead to ketoacid. It was all of this. You, you want to talk about misinformation we've been having misinformation for a long time, um, which, and I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to brush over this. We talked about you going on trial and you wrote a book, you know, nutrition on trial. And it was all because of one. It, I call it the tweet heard around the world. <laughs> yes. Someone set you up and said, what should my, my toddler or young kid should be eating. And you, I, it, I don't want to misquote you, but you said to the effect, vegetables and meat and you went on trial what was the exact answer if you if you i'm sure you remember <laughs> so, so i said i said the key is to win the baby is to win so the key is to win onto the low carbohydrate high fat diet now the the whole basically what the what the health professions council in south africa they wanted to shut me down said I couldn't speak on any topic. And they wanted to shut all doctors down. They wanted to take away our freedom of speech. So what they tried to prove was that I was giving medical advice, not medical information. And there's a subtle difference. Advice is when you speak to an individual. Information is when you talk to the whole world. And they were trying to say that I had been given medical advice when in fact I'd given medical information because the mother had asked for babies, mothers and babies. So that was the key. And, and later on, in one of her tweets, she actively said that I've got all the information I need. So I'm stopping the debate, discussion. And the lawyers, not the lawyers, the people judging me picked that up. And they said, but you weren't giving advice. You were giving information. She even admitted it. So, so the, the end result was it took us four years to, to prove that what I'd said was exactly what the South African dietary guidelines are for weaning. They're identical. What I said and what the guidelines say are identical. And the irony was that the, the key witness for the prosecution was the person who wrote those guidelines. It's astonishing. Wow. So mm -hmm. she wasn't up to saying that actually Dr. Noakes has said exactly what the dietary guidelines are. And so she, she was the key witness and my colleagues just destroyed her. Our legal team absolutely destroyed her. So I said so the point about the trial was it had nothing to do with nutrition. It was about shutting down doctors so that they couldn't say anything about anything in public that the Health Professions Council disagreed with. And they've showed their hand again. They've now taken two people to court for speaking about vaccines, etc. And these people, what they said was true. And again, it's the Health Professions Council wants to control everything that South African doctors can say. And I think that's pretty much what's happening around the world, that doctors are being muzzled if they don't support the narrative. And I didn't support the nutrition narrative, and so I had to be shut down. 
In fact, the lady who was the key witness, she said, your problem was you didn't mention grains. <laughs> that was, if I just mentioned grains, she would have been happy with it. You know, it's crazy. Um, our mutual friend, Nina Taishos, um, you know, I, I, she went and testified. Yeah. And she was telling me that during the breaks, the attorneys from the other side was coming over with their books, asking her to sign them. You yeah, know, exactly. <laughs> they were fangirl and fanboying out on, on Nina Taishos. It, the whole thing. And you would say, okay, they went through this trial and that was enough. They they couldn't beat this guy. He beat the government. And then they came back again and yep. decided, hey, we, we're going to take another swat at this. What mm -hmm. made them come back again? What, what piece of information made them think that they can beat you a second time? So the key legal guy for the opposition, for the prosecution, charged them a huge amount of money. And then he lost the case. So I have the information. It may not be true. Sorry, just before I get there. When he started the trial, he was overweight and with type 2 diabetes. When the trial ended, he was underweight and no more type 2 diabetes. <laughs> God. <laughs> so at least he got the message. And he was a medical doctor. He trained at my medical school a few years ahead of me. So he knew me, et cetera. But anyway, so, so he... he the reason he he wanted the books to be signed uh, was obviously because he had an interest, but I had to sign my book for him as well, which cured his diabetes. Crazy. It's crazy. But, but the, the story from my legal team was that he charged them so much to represent them for the first part of the trial. He felt guilty and he said, well, actually, I'll do the rest without charge. <laughs> so, so that was the one explanation. It's just unbelievable what we what we waste money on. And, you know, you, you touched the third rail by mentioning, you know, the vaccines now. You know, that's something I've, I've, I've always stayed clear of on the show because there is no winning just by mm -hmm. bringing up the vaccine. And, we're, you know, I don't have a side. I, I don't yeah. know if the vaccine was good. I don't know if it was bad. I don't I, I don't know. I'm not a you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a chemist and I don't know how that works in the body. But. You know, we it seems like we started going, at least in this country, we started going on this weird road mm -hmm. of, hey, let's give it to every child. And in fact, children were never at risk yet. Mm -hmm. You know, we're pushing for every child to be on this drug. And, and that's where I drew a line and went, well, wait a minute. You know, and then we started learning more. You know, it wasn't anybody. It was mostly, you know, people past a certain age that were mm -hmm. dying from it. And people with comorbidities and, you know, you know, and on and on and on. Yet we didn't have that information. You know, we, we're supposed to be the information highway, right? Mm -hmm. And and we have no information. We only have the information that they will allow you. And I see it every day on this device, on my cell phone, because, you know, there are certain people that want to keep people like me down mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Um, I noticed that my Instagram never grows. I'm, I'm at like 67 yeah. or 68,000 people. And I'll see where thousands of people will come in every day and, and be part of my Instagram. But Instagram also takes away the same number. I've been at the same number on Instagram now for three months. Yeah. Because they just go for every person that signs up, we're going to take someone away. And then people write to me and go, hey, why did you drop me from your Instagram? I, was like, I, I didn't do anything. Yeah. You know, talk to the people over at Facebook who's doing this, right? Because they want people like me, people like you to be stifled for whatever reason, right? I didn't, I, I've never said anything bad about Facebook or Instagram or anyone or Twitter. Twitter was the same way. Yeah. Elon Musk took over and my Twitter started growing again. Yeah. Okay. What, what happened? <laughs> what happened there? Right. <laughs> It's, so it's, I was I was banned twice on Twitter. The first time was for 10 hours. The next one was for 10 hours. And then I, they wouldn't allow me back on. And only I only came back on about three weeks ago when someone decided to help me get back on. And all of a sudden I was back on again. So the, the FBI didn't like me for, I think that I pointed out that the people driving the vaccination story in South Africa were extremely wealthy and were extremely well funded by organizations in North America. So that that wasn't very acceptable. But that was the facts. Yeah, yeah, you know, shutting down half of the conversation is no way to to get the truth mm -hmm. out. 
Uh, I'm going to do a quick ad here, and I want to get into uh, talking about um, reversing diabetes, if it's possible, with our big pharma. And I want to get into the study. The, the real reason I had you on is a study. But folks, uh, my company, purecoffeeclub.com, for the month of April, April 2023. So if you're hearing this podcast in the future, this won't count. But for April 2023, you can get 15% off at uh, purecoffeeclub.com. Uh, people go, well, Vinny, how did you get your own coffee? Did, did you just get someone to put your name? Put, put? No, 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 no. I actually went out. I created these roasts. Um, I believe in these roasts. These are roasts that I like. I, I've been a coffee lover. Some people call me a connoisseur. I don't know if I rise to that level, but I love coffee. And over the years, I started roasting coffee and coming up with my own blends and using different green beans from around the world. And those are the ones, the honey process, the house blend, uh, the athletic blend, where I actually, um, I, I used to, I, I use beans with much higher caffeine in it. So when you want to do something athletically, it will actually be an ergogenic. We were talking about PEDs a little while ago. This is a natural PED. Um, so go check it all out. We also have the double French, which is a very, very nice dark roast. 15% off for this month only. Promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, and you'll get 15% off at purecoffeeclub.com. We're talking to the guy who wrote one of my favorite books, Law of Running. And, um, uh, you know, you had type 2 diabetes at 28. You know, you would have been... I've, I've personally, since I've been on the internet doing this for 11 years, I've seen now thousands of people reverse their type 2 diabetes. They had uh, A1Cs of over 12, 9, mm -hmm. 10, 11. I've, I've heard numbers all over the board. And we've safely got them below 5.6 just by giving them free information. And uh, they're off of Ozempic and, you know, Metformin and all of these drugs. Um, why is it possible, Doc? What have I been doing that I don't know? <laughs> Yeah, so so diabetes is obviously carbohydrate intolerance, and the key is you have to get rid of the carbohydrates. And as long as you get it down to low enough values, you can reverse the diabetes in most people. My problem was that I had type two diabetes for so long that my system was become so resistant that I can't quite get off metformin. I have to use metformin, and under metformin, my glucose control is essentially perfect. But if I don't have my metformin, it gets it raises up and becomes pre diabetic, pre diabetic again. So my opinion is it's good for me to keep my glucose as low as I possibly can. So I continue to use metformin. But so I can't be diagnosed with type two diabetes at the moment. I'm type two diabetes in remission, but I'm incredibly sensitive to carbohydrate. I mean, it's just if I stop taking my metformin for two days, I get back into the pre into the diabetic range. Really? That's, that's, yeah. That's how close it is, but I'm perfect when I'm taking my metformin. So that's even on a low carbohydrate diet, by the way. So I'm right at the end. And it's obvious because I ran all these miles and, and fueled it with carbs. And the irony was the only time I really felt healthy was when I was training 160 Ks a week and I was running 30 or 40 miles on the weekend. And then I would feel fantastic because I'd get rid of all the carbs and become ketogenic and feel fantastic because then my system was working burning fat etc and it was in good shape so so that was my story the reality is the, the only people who can't reverse their type 2 diabetes on your diet is those who have had the disease for too long and they've damaged themselves or else they don't actually follow the diet and they don't get the carbohydrate intake low enough because they've got a sugar addiction or a or a processed food addiction and they continue to eat just enough sugar. And, and the point, as you know, is it's you, you're going along this with a high glucose, and then you finally get your gluc carbohydrate down and you, your glucose drops like that and your HbA1c becomes normal. But if you're sitting here, it could be five grams too much in your diet and you're in trouble. But you drop below those five grams and you then, it is, then you're healthy. And people don't understand it. It's the cliff. You've got to get down that cliff. You've got to get the carbs below what you can cope with. So I tell people now, the most important decision, nutritional decision you make in your life is to find 
your carbohydrate threshold and you want to be below that threshold, which keeps you away from pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. And once you go over it, you're in trouble. What frustrates me is that I walk around the streets in South Africa and as you will in, in North America, and I see all these people with visceral obesity. And if you've got visceral obesity, you're pre-diabetic. I'm sorry. Yeah. If I tested you pro properly, you'd be pre-diabetic and you will die of diabetes. You'll die of the complications of diabetes. And I watched my dad die of the complications of diabetes and it's a most terrible disease. And it's so simple to correct. You have to change your behavior. behavior. You have to eat low carbs and you've got to get rid of the sugar addiction. And once you do that, the results are spectacular. Yeah, you know, I always say, you know, in, in this country, we, we, we have this thing where we go, well, fat is beautiful. If you watch a Dove commercial, Dove soap, mm. and, you know, they don't use skinny models anymore. They have overweight women, you, go, you know, and they're in a bra and pant, you know, panties. And love your body, love your body. It's like, <clears throat> okay, I get it. We shouldn't be fat shaming. Fat shaming has never changed anything for anyone. I don't agree with it. I will never agree with fat shaming. But to say that someone is morbidly obese, we have um, the superstar here. She's a singer named, um, oh God, her name is slipping my, Lizzo. And she's very talented, beautiful voice. She's a, a flautist and, you know, she does all of this stuff, but she's morbidly obese. <clears throat> and she flaunts it in such a way to say, hey, look, I love my body. I love who I am. I'm perfectly healthy. And I'm always going, great, honey. I'm glad that you love yourself. But you're not perfectly healthy, you're perfectly sick. You mm. can't be that size without having, at the very least, fatty liver disease, sleep apnea, fat, you know, uh, type two diabetes. And I can, I could probably come up with five that she has that where I can look at her and never take a blood test and go, you have those five things. There's no way that you don't. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're mimicking uh, the same thing here, you know, and the other thing you brought up, and I think it's important in, in Maybe I want you to go back and explain this again, because people, they drive along and they don't really hear this. And I really want them to hear what you say, because people say to me all the time, Tim, they'll say, well, how many grams of carbs can I have a day? Is it 20 grams? Is it 30? Is it 50? I heard a guy on the internet told me I can have 70. And I always say it depends. Some mm -hmm. people can be in dietary ketosis at 50 grams of carbs a day. Some people have to be at zero and some people can have 10 grams of carbs that may slip in with a vegetable or something. What say you on the subject? I absolutely agree. You have to find out what you need, what you can tolerate. And for me, it's below 25 grams. And in fact, most days it's naught grams. And then like my glucose control is, is perfect, but it, you have to find out, but people just don't understand as I've tried to indicate that this story You've got to get below that amount that will then sort your body out. You've got to get the insulin way down. And as, as long as your insulin's above six units, in South Africa, micro units per, per ml, if, you got to, if you're below six, you'll be, you'll be pretty healthy. But above six, and 99% of the population are not below six. And as soon as you have it above six, you know, I was looking through some of our old studies where we, where we had athletes exercising for two or three hours and by chance we got the instance either at five or six and at six it inhibited fat metabolism at five they just burned fat all the time and it was one unit one unit of insulin made the difference between burning plenty of fat during exercise or inhibiting that that fat use and that's what happens and so most people are running at 10 15 20 30 you're having a hope you're never going to burn fat you're always going to burn carbohydrates what i've learned in the last six months or so is that humans only burn carbohydrates for one reason listen carefully everyone it is true that you do need it for your brain function so let's put that aside that your liver can produce all the glucose you need for your brain except if you go and run for four or five hours then you do need to top up with a little bit of glucose but now let's take that out of it the reason you burn carbohydrate is to regulate your blood glucose. It's as simple as that. The whole body, the body's metabolic regulation is focused on one thing, keeping your blood glucose flat. That's the goal. Humans evolved to keep our blood glucoses low because we, burnt, we ate mainly fat and protein. 
Then we introduce carbohydrates and you get these glucose spikes and the body responds as if it's a complete disaster. It's got to get your glucose down again. So you secrete insulin and that takes the glucose out of the bloodstream into the liver and the muscles. You inhibit fat metabolism and you burn the excess carbohydrate or if you can't burn it, you store it as fat. And that's the response. Every time you eat, that's what happens. Now, where we made an error was we, we told people to carbohydrate load and so that you eat lots of carbohydrate and you store it in your muscles. Now, when you go and exercise, the body says, thank goodness I can get rid of this carbohydrate. I'm going to burn it now until it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and so we said, oh, you see, the body needs that carbohydrate. We've proven in the last few weeks, you don't, you don't need that carbohydrate. It's being burned because you've got to get rid of it. The body anticipates the next meal, which is going to be full of carbohydrates. So it says, let's get rid of this carbohydrate immediately so that the next meal we can store the glucose in the liver and in the muscles. And so we don't get such a big excursion and we don't have to secrete so much insulin. And once you understand that, then you understand what makes people healthy. And what makes people healthy is not getting these glucose spikes every three hours or four hours. Keeping your glucose and insulin flat, that's what makes you healthy. And that means no or very limited carbohydrates in the diet. Yeah, you know, I've proven over and over on myself in one experiment where I've, I've climbed the highest point in the contiguous United States several times on zero carbs, uh, Mount Whitney, it's only 14.5, 14.6, to be honest. I uh, went to Europe and, and did a glacier there. I did Mont Blanc and Grand Paradiso over in Italy. I did those two. Again, low carb, zero carb. I was eating in Italy. I was eating lardo the whole day before I took off. Um, and when I did Mont Blanc, I had nothing. But I've always mentioned that before I leave, I will stop in the store and buy a small amount of candy, like um, uh, suckers or gummy bears, and stick them in my pocket. And people will say to me, whoa, wait a minute, Mr. No Carb, why, why do you have... You don't want to be stuck at 17,000 feet, you know, high, high altitude, and have a sugar bomb. You know, mm -hmm. if you go too hard for one section or something and you run through your sugar, you might have to level off. Now... Every time I've done those mountains, I've stayed within my my game plan. I didn't have to, you know, I didn't get stuck in a crevasse. I didn't get stuck in a in a storm where I would be burning more energy and need to pull those gummy bears out of my pocket, right? But they were there for a reason, to save my life, to get me home so I can try again another day. And people never understand that. It's like, well, if you're so confident about this, why would you bring sugar with you at all? It's like the same reason I bring a Zippo lighter. You know, I don't smoke but I might have to light a fire on that mountain to save my life. That's right. Right. So, you know, when you try to explain that to people, they just don't get it. Yeah. Right. You're absolutely right. One of the findings mm -hmm. I've had, again, checking the literature, is that during exercise, you start burning lots of carbohydrate and then you slowly reduce it because you're trying to get rid of it. But the glucose in the bloodstream, you just burn more and more and more and more. Now, that is unusual. It's unexpected. But people didn't notice it. They didn't notice that whilst you're cutting down your total carbohydrate use, you're actually burning more and more blood glucose. And then the point is reached, ultimately, where you run out of blood glucose. The liver can't keep going if you're exercising vigorously. And that's then you get hypoglycemic, and then you're in real trouble because you can't move. You'll stop. So that's why it is absolutely correct. But you just need a tiny amount, 5, 10, 15 grams. That's all you need. You reverse the hypoglycemia and you're in good shape again. You know, one so, of the first, I didn't mean to cut you off, go on. So we're currently about to start an experiment where we're going to work out the minimum amount of carbohydrate you need to prevent your blood glucose falling. And go because on. at the moment, athletes are told to have 120 grams of carbohydrate every hour. I mean, that is just, that's diabetogenic. That's just causing diabetes. You don't need it. There's no logic to that at all. Maybe you need five grams. Maybe you need 20. Maybe you need 30, but you don't need 120. But no one studied the least. Because industry directs these, these researchers, the industry wants them to say, you must eat as much carbohydrate as possible. So they start at the, the right end, extreme end, 90 to 120 grams. And then they do find a difference because they compare to zero, but they don't compare it to 10 grams an hour, which is what they should do. 
then we'll get a real analysis, real answer to the question. One of the things I figured out, I figured this out about 15, maybe 15 plus years ago, when I first started, you know, in, in my off season, you know, I was an ultra cyclist, when in my off season, I would only eat meat, I would, you know, say I need to get protein, I would hit the gym as hard as I can put on as much meat as I could as much lean body mass as I could, because I knew I would ravish my body again, once I got back on the, the bicycle. Mm -hmm. And um, I would always eat, you know, lots of meat, eggs, everything off of the bike. But once I got on the bike, you know, it was goo and, you know, power bars or wh whatever, you know, sustained energy, whatever the, the sugary drink was. And then after cancer, I, I had leukemia, I wanted to go as low carb as I could. So I started, that's when I started doing the whole, hey, let me bring fat, let me bring olive oil, I would bring little vials of olive oil with me and try to do that. And it was working. It's like, wait a minute, I didn't need as many carbs as I thought I needed. And then I learned a trick, which I didn't know what I learned, you you now have done the studies. But I noticed that whenever I was getting ready to bonk, and you know, the feeling you're a runner, Absolutely. you know, you know, five minutes before you go into a bonk that you're getting ready, yeah. you get that feeling that, that lightheadedness, you're, you're feeling yeah. drunk. And um, I remember one day squeezing some goo into my mouth. And I was holding it in my mouth and just holding it in my mouth before it went down my gullet before it can do anything. My brain got the message. Oh, wait, we have sugar again. We're good. Yeah. And I thought it was it. I went home, I couldn't sleep that night thinking about that. So the, the next time I went for a long ride, I said, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get very close to a bonk. And then I'm gonna put and I brought lifesavers candies, because it's just a little measured amount of sugar. I got close to a bonk, I threw a lifesaver in my mouth and just stuck it between my my gum, cheek and gum. Within a minute, I felt better. It's like, wait a minute, there's no way this is in my body. My liver has no idea this sugar is in my mouth. But my brain knows, and is pulling me out of a bonk. It's allowing yeah. my body to now release more, more sugar, more insulin, whatever it needs to keep going. And that's when I, I started my I started call it sugar, sugar trickling, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever I thought I was going to bonk, I started buying lifesavers a lot cheaper than goo, a lot cheaper than cliff bars and everything else. I would just throw a lifesaver in my mouth because it was a measured amount of sugar. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just yeah. let it trickle in my mouth. Yeah, that was not an experiment. That was just me going, this is how I'm cheating the system. You yeah. guys have now done that study. Is that correct? We're about to do it, but sorry, we have done other studies and the evidence that I have going through the literature and publishing articles at the moment, looking at the literature, Christensen and Hansen and Boyer in 1936 and 1939, they showed, they, they had people do exactly what you did. They had them exercise till their blood glucose had dropped so low that they were about to faint. And then they did give them quite a lot of carbohydrate and they recovered immediately and continued and they could continue for another hour so if it was muscle glycogen that had caused them to stop they, that little carbohydrate amount wouldn't have been wouldn't have been the solution so yes the uh, the research has been done and it was interesting because boyer and christensen and hansen said both said this is working in the brain because their metabolism hasn't changed they measured the metabolism they measured how much carbohydrate they were using and it didn't change so they said, well, it's not because the carbohydrates being used by the muscles, the carbohydrates is influencing the brain. And we know that there now that there are sensors in the mouth that influence the brain and the brain in anticipation, exactly what you said. The brain anticipates that glucose is now arriving, so it's fine. So the system works the following that once you're, if you start with a certain blood glucose, the moment it starts to drop below that blood glucose level, the brain says, okay, we're in trouble. And after about half an hour, it'll slow you down because that's the only way it can protect the brain from this very low blood glucose. It reduces the glucose used by muscle by slowing you down. And then eventually you, you can't exercise. And then if you reverse that, you get the blood glucose, the glucose to the brain increased, you're fine. And then you recover. They usually took about 10 minutes to get fully recovered. And then they could go on for another hour. In your case, you because you didn't swallow it, you're using it in the mouth, you're, you're activating the quicker re response. 
I had one particular example like that. Uh, when we were experimenting with glucose, and we developed the first goo in the world, by the way, called FRN, Fordyce, Rose, and Noakes. Fordyce was the uh, ultra marathon champion. Bernard Rose was the South African marathon champion. And myself, when we developed the first squeezy in the world called Lepin yeah. FRN. So we were doing this. And, and I remember in one experiment, I, I ran a 56K race. That's about 35 miles. And I was not carbohydrate loading. I was in the middle of heavy training. I The day before, I went and ran 16Ks, 10 miles. And at about with about 15Ks to go, I was in real trouble. And I told my second, when I slow down, you just give this me. And I said, no, I don't want it. So anyway, she forced me to drink it. Within five minutes, I was running much faster than I had been. And I finished that race the fastest I ever finished any race in my life in wow. the ultramarathon. So it's interesting that that hypoglycemia sets you up. And if you reverse it, it's like your performance has actually improved. So I don't know. That's something that people haven't considered. Improvement of performance by carbohydrates reversing hypoglycemia. And in a sense, it's what Boyer and Christensen and Hansen wrote. They said, once we corrected our fatigue, we could go on forever. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting when when guys like me just ride a bike and we we figure this stuff out and we tell it to people. They go, well, there's never been a study. It's like, well, there was just an N1 experiment that worked and it keeps working. And I'm passing your ass up on four mile long climbs. So something is working. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not taking EPO. I'm not taking, you know, <laughs> yeah. something is working here. <clears throat> and, but we, a lot of times we just look past it and go, well, it, it can't work that way. Right. But in fact, it does. Now you, you alluded to it. You just did a study, the paper's out. Um, you guys did zero carbs on these athletes. Uh, can you give me the, the program? No, it was about 50, it was about 50 grams of carbs so that they did that for between four and six weeks. And so it was complete serendipity. So we first studied guys running five Ks on the treadmill and we found that didn't any, no benefit, no disadvantage from a high fat diet or a high carbohydrate diet. They were identical. What we noticed was that when they ate the high fat diet, they were burning much more fat. But but it was it was higher than most people had reported, but it wasn't particularly spectacular. So the next thing we did was the guy said to me, so what do we do next? I said, well, you make it shorter distance so that the intensity is higher. So we said, okay, we'll do a mile. We'll do a mile race on the treadmill. And then I said, we have to do six times 800 meter repetitions. Because if you want to deplete muscle glycogen, that's the way you do it. After about three or four, these guys will have no glycogen on the high fat diet and they won't be able to run. So they won't be able to complete the fifth or the sixth interval or they'll do it so slowly they'll just walk. So that was that was the goal. The goal was to show that if we took people on a high fat diet with low muscle glycogen, they wouldn't be able to sustain their performance over six times 800 meter repetitions. What I didn't tell the scientists was to measure their metabolism during this the intervals and they did, which was amazing because we got the serendipitous finding. So what happened? There was no difference in performance. It didn't matter whether they're eating carbs or fat. Their performance during those six times 800 meters were identical. But most importantly, we recorded the highest rates of fat oxidation ever reported in humans, ever. And the textbook says, and I'm sure textbook law of running says it. In fact, I am probably could go and, <laughs> go and find it here. It says that once you go beyond 85% of VO2 max, you burn no fat. That's what the textbooks say. And we found the highest rates of fat oxidation at 86% of VO2 max. So, so we destroyed that. Now, why did we destroy it? Because we were the first people in 100 years to test the hypothesis, to try to disprove it. Everyone else has just accepted it. The Scandinavians, 1967, they proved that glycogen is essential for high-intensity exercise. They didn't because they didn't try to disprove it. And, that, and we did, we've now disproved it. So this is this is a major problem for for the exercise scientists and also for the nutritionists who've been telling us as I did in this book to eat high carbohydrate diets and we were wrong and so now we have to change that advice. Now the final point in that paper was we showed that 30% of our 10 athletes either 3 of the 10 were pre-diabetic on the high carbohydrate diet. On the high fat diet it went completely they were completely normal. 
And in fact, the ones who were pre-diabetic benefited the most from the high-fat diet. So they were pre-diabetic, despite the fact that they hadn't put on weight, they hadn't put, hadn't put on fat, and they hadn't changed their diet other than increasing the carbohydrate content. So this is the first proof that the carbohydrate content of the diet is driving diabetes. No one's ever proven that before. They've all said, oh, you've got to get obese and then you get your diabetes. No, no. We should just increase the carbohydrate intake in people who are insulin resistant, and that's enough to cause prediabetes and ultimately diabetes. You know, it's interesting. Last night, <clears throat> I read somewhere where these two high school students in Louisiana, of all places, place where I grew up, <clears throat> uh, finally uh, did proofs to figure out that Pythagorean theorem um, can be beaten. And I looked at that and I went, wait a minute. Uh, that was at least 500 years before Christ. When, and scientists have been trying to beat this mm -hmm. and find different proofs for all these years. And these two young ladies at some high school in Louisiana has now put something forth to go, hey, we figured out that the, the sum of the two squares are not as big as the, <laughs> the square on the long side. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, is it is it possible? Is, is it possible? But this is kind of like that, not as big because we yeah. have, you know, Pythagorean theorem has been around since before Christ. This yeah. is not that old. Yet, I, if you would have asked me before I read that study and called Jana and said, Jana, I need, I need Tim, I need Tim, I need to talk to this guy. <laughs> I, I, I've been telling people now for 20 years that you cannot go past 79% of your aerobic capacity because your body will start dipping into its own sugar to the point where you will bonk. Yeah. And yeah. you just said 86%. So uh, let me put this in terms that people can understand. Zone one is up to 69% of your aerobic capacity. Uh, zone two is between 70 and 79%. We're in agreement there, right, Dr. Nook? Yeah. And then yeah. uh, th zone three is is 80 to 89 percent and then zone four is 90 to 100 percent and then zone five is beyond so you're proving that when we're make we're pushing that hard 86 percent we can still do it and be not fasted of sugar but we can do it on a ketogenic diet yeah and i and i'll tell you what's more so we showed that you you could produce 76 kilojoules of energy that's two grams of fat every minute. Now, it turns out that Elliot Kipchoge, who runs a sub two hour marathon, is 52 kilograms, and it predicts that he would require 76 kilojoules of energy every minute that he's running. He could provide that purely on fat, according to our calculations. Now, people would say, oh, you know, that's ridiculous. All Kenyans eat high carbohydrate diets. Yes, they do, but no one's ever tried to run a two-hour marathon on a high-fat diet. And until we do it, we've not disproved that you can't do it. That's the point. But the, the, the way we studied it, it seems like you potentially could. And 76 kilojoules per minute will get you through an incomplete Ironman yeah. and win the Ironman in, let's say, eight hours, maybe not in seven hours, but in eight hours. You'll be able to do everything in the Ironman without any carbs, except to top up your blood glucose. So that's the way we're moving. You, By you, the way, just, just a final point that Dave Scott, who was, you know, the great Iron sure. Man triathlete, he read my book and he'd converted to the high fat diet. He said, Tim, if I'd known about this diet when I was an Iron Man champion, I would have gone 40 minutes faster. <laughs> so. Well, look, I mean, um, um, the guy who beat him, Alan, um, yeah. who's been on this podcast several times, converted to high fat at yeah, some point. That's right. And right. um and trained only in zone two to to end up beating Dave Scott yeah, yeah. On, in those subsequent years. Um you live on a continent where you can get hold to uh they're not very close to you, but you're in South Africa and they're in Kenya. Um you can get hold of some of these people because mm -hmm. the, these people in these countries in the African nation, uh these African nations. They're some of the best runners in the world. Are you guys looking at pulling some of these people into the lab and trying this? Or 
Yeah, we have actually. David, We've studied. Oh, oh so of, you have? Okay. We have studied some of the best Kenyans, not, but they they like two hundred nine or two hundred eight marathon or two hundred five. They're not two hour marathon runners. So right. they're not very, but very no one no one really we have one guy that you know nike yeah. keeps getting this guy down to the two but look if we could get 209 people and th that's pretty damn fast nobody yeah. in america not in this not north america no one's doing that here you know we might have a couple of mexicans pretty close but that's about it those you know there's some great runners in, in mexico but you guys have some of the, the most elite runners within within your continent so it would stand to reason that you of all people can do the study, right? It's it's very complex, but we have had some of the best of some just below top Kenyan runners in our laboratories. That's correct over the years. And, you know, basically you could predict that they, they sustain these very high rates of oxygen consumption for two hours, two and a half hours, high percentage VO2 maxes, but exactly why they can do it, uh, we're not sure. My own opinion is that they train so hard and they they work as a team that that's they just become conditioned to running at that that high speeds and they out they train at altitude and they train in groups and you know it's 30 or 40 people training together in these camps and that makes a huge difference and they all you know they're all right there or thereabouts yeah and the reason why no one, no country can match them is because they just don't have enough really good runners to train together under these difficult conditions. You know, I love Elliot Kipchoge, but for when he's training, he lives in a, a very ordinary building, you know, with a little bit of running water. He's got no luxuries whatsoever. And he just trains and uh, he's... There's such a mental component to it, and he believes he can do it. And I, I gather he's running Boston soon and hoping to to do well there, as of course he will. So I think it's it's the physiology is superior. You know, you're not allowed to say this, but I do believe they have a there's just more Kenyan runners and Ethiopian runners who've just got unbelievable biology. They collect together, they train together, they inspire each other, they work as a team. And uh, they just marvelous, marvelous self-belief that they can do it. And I mean, if you're training with Elliot Kipchoge and let's say you're a minute slower than him in training, would you say, well, that's better than all the rest of the world <laughs> because yeah. no one can get within a minute of him. So therefore I must be the second best in the world. And I think that that makes an, a massive difference. I, I think you're right about that. Every time I've met some of these Kenyan runners, we're just standing next to them, you know, their bodies, their legs seem to be longer than their upper bodies. They're yeah. all legs. And then there's a head on top. You know, it's, it's <laughs> just, they're the most amazing human beings to look at. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I want to respect your time, but I, I, it would be deleterious on my part. If I didn't ask this final question here in the States, um, everybody's going, I've been yelling about this for months and months. Everybody's going crazy now taking diabetes drugs as a weight loss uh, protocol. It, it, Dr. Noakes is driving me up one wall and down the other. It, I, I think doctors should lose their license for doing this, but it's widespread now. It got into our celebrity population. So once that happens, it's game on in America. I, any yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Because I mean, you can take these medications, A, they're very expensive, uh, but eventually when you stop taking them, your weight just goes right back to where it was and you probably gain some excess weight. So diabetes and obesity are behavior conditions. You have to change behavior. That's how I reversed my type 2 diabetes. I was a, had the abnormal behavior. I understood it. I was a sugar addict. I was a carb addict. I got rid of the sugar and the carb addiction. And I have absolutely zero problem regulating my weight. Not one moment does it... Does it worry me because I just don't eat those addictive foods? And that is the only solution. You cannot give medication and hope that that's going to be the solution. Unfortunately, industry is going to make a fortune out of it, but a lot of people are going to be harmed because they're going to go well for a year or two, and then they're going to start eating more carbs and they're going to shoot up again. And we've got to change the behavior and people need to get that message. Um, I I want to be very respectful of your time here, uh, Tim, but I want people to know that they can donate. I will be making a donation to the uh, Noakes Foundation um, later today. And uh, you guys, 
I mean, the, the, the stuff you guys are doing, the studies you guys are doing, um, I want to put this out to my audience. Where can they go? Can you give them the information where they can go? Because folks, listen, here in America, we have Verda, you know, we, we mentioned uh, Foley, Foley, uh, uh, Volick and Finney. Uh, those guys have been at it forever. Uh, my friend Eric Westman has been at it. I'm not quite sure anyone has been doing it for as long and at the intensity that Professor Noakes has been doing it at. So you you really want to go, if you got a couple of extra bucks on you and you want to go donate, where can they go, Tim? Well, they go to the, the Noakes Foundation on the internet or the Nutrition Network. The Nutrition Network is our educational program. And we train doctors and phys physicians and nurses and anyone, who, dietitians all around the world. And that's that's a fantastic program. We've got some of the best programs on the low carb diets and their benefits. And in fact, in a few months' time, we're releasing the first encyclopedia ever on the low carb diet. And it's an nice. amazing collection with all the best authors around the world. And it shows that this is the best studied diet in history, which is amazing. So I was kicked out of my university for promoting a diet which was quackery. So we responded. We said, okay, he has. 250,000 words on this wow. diet. And it's the best studied diet in history. He has the evidence. And we think that's going to be important. So there's the Noakes Foundation, Nutrition Network, all on the internet. And you could follow me on, on Twitter, um, at Prof Tim Noakes, or at Law of Running One. I have two separate accounts. At Prof Tim Noakes, that was the one that was shut down. and But it's now active again. And you'll see I'm very controversial. I tweet what I believe. And <laughs> you get a I whole lot it. of stuff there. Yeah. Keep, keep and doing it. The other one is Law of Running One, at Law of Running One. And it's the number one, not one, oh, no. not O N E. It's just the number yeah. one. I, I remember right. that because I think that's where I see most of your tweets. Uh, quick ad, folks. Uh, I forgot to do it during the show. Villa Capelli, the longest running sponsor of the show. Go check it out. Villa Capelli Olive Oil. Uh, promo code Vinny will get you 10% off. If you spend more than $125 after the discount, you will also get free shipping. Go check out Villa Capelli Olive Oil. Um, it's olive oil. You want to talk, people say, what supplements should I take every day? Olive oil. Take olive oil. It's the only fruit juice that I approve of, and you want to make sure it's 100% pure. Villa Capelli. Go check out Dr. Tim Noakes on Twitter. Um, and also the Noakes Foundation. Go there. Go and do everything you can to help this great man continue to do what he's doing. On behalf of Dr. Tim Noakes, my name is Vinny Tortorich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm.